My favorite. Number three, bitch work. Fancy term, not really that fancy actually, kind of a crude term for uh, essentially aerobic work, right? Trying to build the ability to, actually some anaerobic work as well too. So everything from sprinting uh, in a monostructural atmosphere to uh, long endurance stuff. I think the longest we've ever programmed on the blog, maybe an hour run. We've done longer than that? That's it? An hour run. Yeah, so we've gone about an hour and that's really barely even scratching the surface of true endurance work when you're talking about endurance athletes who race, you know, four to 12 hours, depending on the race in, a, in the real endurance world. So we're barely scratching the surface there. We're just trying to get some capacity in that world. Um, and some really simple things about uh, making this beneficial to you. We all need it, all of us, even those with like marathoner backgrounds, triathlete backgrounds, it's still all something we need to maintain and get better at and understand how it affects other things that we do in the sport. So having a good base gives you a large advantage, but having a good base and being able to balance some, uh, some aerobic work with some of the other skills and movements and domains in CrossFit is really, really important. Um, so ways we can manipulate bitch work to be more effective for us. The number one way you can change this to work better for your needs after you have an assessment is by messing with the uh, work rest ratio. So the amount of time you take off between uh, intervals. And so that basically means if we are trying, let's take a quick example. Anyone want to give me an example and we'll manipulate it for fun as a drill? Go ahead, Xander. Um, how many? Uh, six. How much rest? Uh, one for one. One for one. one for one. Okay, and Xander, how did you approach six 1K rows with equal rest? Um, I really try to go mega splits or um, just trying to be a little bit off of my PR. Okay, so negative splits means the first of the six is the slowest and the last of the six is the fastest. So he's gonna try to build uh, his output across six intervals, which is an extremely difficult skill to gather because that means you have to know exactly what your output is at every moment and how much you can build on it and what the stroke rate looks like. So that's pretty advanced, so that's awesome. And how did the rest affect your ability to uh, do negative splits? Were you able to maintain that through six? Yeah. Okay. Now let's say, and how long about were your 1Ks? 330 maybe? 320? 320. 320. Um, so let's say instead of you, get to, you getting to rest three minutes and 20 seconds, let's say I said rest 60 seconds. Are you still doing negative splits yeah. all the way across and why is that? You're resting, you're resting 130. You're just not able to recover and get enough juice back in your legs, right? You're just not able to flush everything that you're creating in your body fast enough to be able to keep that up. Now, maybe some collegiate rower can do that. Probably can, in fact, but that's not where most CrossFitters are at. So now what if this is extreme? Let's say it's about 2x rest. I said eight minutes. What would you attempt to do there? PR. PR every time. Okay. So you guys see how manipulating the rest, the workout is exactly the same. Row 1K by 6. He can work on three completely different elements by just manipulating his rest. If we're working on maintaining some more steady state stuff, the rest is more like no rest all the way to rest. Maybe 90 seconds would be the longest, and that would be more steady state, right? We wouldn't expect you to have some new burst every time you got back on the rower. We'd expect you to be about the same and trying to hold that. So your first row would be very much, I won't say comfortable, but maintainable, right? You're in control. If we start to step it up a little bit, so this is the more steady state. If we're trying to work kind of that medium zone, that aggressive pace, we talk about resting somewhere in the neighborhood of one to one, plus or minus a minute or so. 
depending on how good you are at recovering and knowing yourself and how fresh you feel after two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, we'll know if that's something you can do. Either just maintaining, trying to be within a couple seconds of your same time each time you get on the rower, or if you can do what Xander does and go negative splits. Finally, if we double the rest, 2x work. We're talking about absolutely crushing. And this distance isn't necessarily appropriate for this. It would be very difficult because Xander might have three at best attempts to pull with all his might all his life. And they'll be, unless he's some superstar that I'm not aware of, I don't know if you're going to games this year, Xander, or what, but it's more like this. Right? Four, five, and six yeah. turn into complete dog shit. There should be nothing left if you did it correct, right? You should have completely emptied the tank. That's 10 minutes of rowing at 90% plus intensity. You shouldn't even be able to get three. It's more like two. So you do one and the second is survival mode. So that's how it changes things. So depending on what you need as an athlete, whether that's sprint work, whether that's you know in the anaerobic side of things, whether that's learning how to maintain a pace and be you know have a steady state, have something that you could always go to, some sort of forever pace in a metcon. That's how it translates over. That's how we know how fast we should row or bike or run in a metcon. Or we need to work on the middle distance of just getting a little more aggressive than what we're comfortable with and trying to build on that and trying to find a new base. Build our, you know, if we're comfortable holding 145 in the rower, maybe we're trying to get comfortable holding 143. And that's a huge improvement, um, even in the short run, even in the long run. So manipulating rest is the number one way to do it. The other way uh, is just manipulating the amount of work. So in the last example, we took it down from six intervals to three intervals. That's knowing what your capacity is in a window of exercise. So if, you, if we had something like sprint 100 meters times 15, we'll say. Well, it's only 1,500 meters, not even a mile, so that far. But the intensity we expect is so great that you might run six or seven and be completely cooked. You, your, your groin is lit up, your calves are lit up, your hamstrings are just toast. So five, six, seven may be the appropriate dose for you. Or we might have some sprinter who that's, you know, that's what they do, that's where they live, and they're trying to improve on an already insane time, and they can do somewhere between 10 and 15 intervals, and that's an appropriate dose for them. So we can change the amount of overall volume also in that world to have a solid training day. The last thing we want to do is get you to the point where you're so wrecked from doing stuff like this that the rest of the week is not effective. You can't warm up right, you feel tight, you pull a muscle, you set yourself back three weeks, like, that's not what we're trying to do. So number one, always, is adjusting the rest. And number two, a close second, is adjusting the volume. Makes sense. And that takes a lot of self-assessment. You have to know what is appropriate for you. And obviously we can't tell every single person that comes to the blog, that's why people have coaches. Because they have a good understanding. They can start to read it in the body language. They can look you in the eyes and say, hey, you've had enough, that's enough intervals. <laughs> That's where that comes into play. Training partners can get good at that too. Questions on bitch work and how you should try to execute them effectively for you. Told you I'm gonna fly over this stuff unless we have a conversation here. Okay. What's the, what's the appropriate time to step between the last metcon or the last workout before you start the bitch work so that you get the most effective training out? First, it shouldn't be an order set in your mind okay. that you follow each day should be constantly mixed up. You should set your order, I think, before you start your training day, but it shouldn't always be the same. It shouldn't be like lift first every day, bitch work second, metcon third, accessory fourth. Mix it up. Because are you training for the sports side of things or just your own fitness or what? So it may, may matter less in, in those terms, but I still think it's important to mix the stimulus your body's getting at different points of the training day. For the sport specific athletes, it's extremely important because we don't get to choose the order of our testing, right? So we have to be able to adapt to everything. Um, but time between, that is completely independent on the athlete as well. So it's kind of a intangible, I mean, I guess we could actually run tests and have metrics on it, but we don't typically in the gym. It's sort of a thing, are you willing and able to bring intensity to whatever the piece requires, whether it be sprint high intensity, or maybe it's a low, uh, low intensity steady, or maybe it's just accessory work, you can take your time. Are you, at this point, ready and willing to go through that and crush it? If you hesitate, 
then you're not ready, okay? And whether that's mental or physical, again, that's a whole nother topic, but it's important because going through the motions and just taking the volume in will be detrimental in the long run versus doing the appropriate amount of volume and hitting it with the intensity that the piece is asking you to hit it with based on the descriptions, based on the way it's written, based on the way it fits into the day. All those things matter, all those things should be taken into account. So you're asking a really big question. Okay, well, I mean, just, so. An important question, but big. Yep. And I literally do the workouts one, two, three, four, five. How you write? Oh, yeah, I think, I think a lot of people probably do that. So, pro tip, mix them up. So mentally, that would be, I, I would, I would want to do that too, because then I can empty the tank on something that takes less, less skill, not actually, but sort of. Um, but I think you should mix it up more often and then see how things feel after. You should do bitch work and then have you back squat and see how it affects you. Like that's, but again, you would now decide what the appropriate amount of rest is between falling off the rower after your intervals and like loading the first plate on your barbell. Are you ready to squat? Ask yourself that, am I ready to squat? And then as you start to build through those sets, you, you'll feel if you're ready to squat and you can make that adjustment appropriately. So you start building up near your percentages and things aren't going well or things are going real well, now you get to execute and go back to lifts and you get to think about how to implement that. Am I making it a skill day? Am I just working on my foot position? Am I working on mobilizing my hips and getting a little deeper and pausing at the bottom and testing things? Like how are you approaching that lift after you've just put yourself in that position? Make sense? You gotta all be really thinking about this. Like the last thing I want is a bunch of misfit robots that think it has to be done exactly the way it's written. It's just a guideline. The blog is a guideline. It's got a lot of good ideas, but not if you follow them blindly. You have to be free thinkers and you have to make self-assessment all day. All day you're in the gym. You have to be self-assessing. Other questions on bitch work? Yes. to you oh, and right. to this person and to this person, but I don't know what your order of importance is. So obviously, you don't do the warm up after your fourth piece. So we can stick that one safely in the first position. <laughs> From there, no. So uh, it would have to be based, again, based on you, based on how you feel after certain things, and based on, I mean, these are different every day, right? So you, you're not quite sure what you're gonna get a lot of days. And so you would kind of look at it as a puzzle and figure out how you wanna fit it into your training window, whether that means you're cutting out two pieces because you have a shorter day or just the volume's completely inappropriate for you. So I'm doing the warm up and I'm hitting these two super hard and that's my training day, see you later. Like that might be the answer a lot of times. So order is very dependent to the day, to the athlete, to the pieces. Do you ever do, uh Intervals based on watts, like staging your watts. One row. Like try to hold. Try to hold a watt, and then the next stage. Go to Only for individuals. So it's a that's a specific thing. So if I asked you to hold a certain wattage on a bike, uh, you are gifted with some very long levers that can spin the shit out of those pedals. And I asked Moran, sorry, I'm picking on you again, to spin the same bike at the same speed and hold the same wattage. Mechanically, it's not fair. Right? So that's not a good way to um, program for the masses. If you were working with an individual athlete and you knew what they're capable of, what their output is, that's a very solid way to make um, uh, you know, noticeable change. And that's where executing your own workouts, again, comes into play. So if you know your wattage, you know what's comfortable. Like I know my running wattage, I know my biking wattage, sort of know my rowing wattage. I can decide in my bitch work, uh, I'm doing my 1K, I'm doing or 2K bike by six today. I will hold X wattage, X RPM the entire time. That's my goal. And I will rest until I'm positive. I can hold that wattage again for my next 2K. Another way to manipulate it, another way to make noticeable difference. And when we get to Metcons and intervals, I'll give you more examples of that. But you understand how that would, yeah, you just can't program that for the masses. It wouldn't make sense. As a test, it makes fine sense, right? You're testing people as a training piece, it makes zero sense. <laughs> accessories. What the hell are accessories anyway? We just kind of throw that name out there like it's, that's right, make the guns. <laughs> that's where we make guns. Um, so an accessory, I, I usually call them extras nowadays. An extra is just any, 
Any extra piece I think we can fit in appropriately given the volume that I'm asking, given the intensity that I'm asking, that will be tested eventually in our sport. So usually they're paired up with either, time is up, okay, let's warm up. Usually they're paired up either with the lift of the day, so they kind of go hand in hand, or they have a specific focus within the cycle. So for instance, post open cycle two we're in right now, the extra or accessory or whatever you want to call it is strength bias this cycle. So every extra piece I write has something to do with the lift. So on days that we're deadlifting super heavy, you may see additional RDLs, you could see single leg deadlifts, you could see GHRs uh, on the GHD, you could see good mornings, you could see all kinds of additional things. If we're going heavy on the sumo deadlift, I might have you go super light for high rep and good morning. And I'm gonna kind of give you a stimulus of both. Um, same thing with the squats. You see sandbag squats, possibly after a back squat or front squat this cycle. Um, we have some strict gymnastics and pressing days. We're trying to kind of, I don't want to use the old school bodybuilding term superset, but we are combining two ends of the spectrum in similar movements and giving you a dose of both in the same day. And as you recover, you kind of get both ends of it. So that's the purpose there. And that's specific to this cycle. Other times we have gymnastic accessories, you know, pushing, pulling again. Some of the things uh, we talked about uh, in warm ups that you can add in are some of the things that we do put um, as options in the accessory piece. And it's just a little bit of extra stuff to help you guys, if you're at that level, stay caught up with other things. We can't fit into a Metcon, but it doesn't hurt to do five sets of 15 super heavy kettlebell swing and really get comfortable with that thing. It's a real easy thing to add into accessory, okay? It gets you comfortable with something that maybe you don't touch a whole lot and uh, could have some exposure to. Low volume, sometimes low intensity, it fits in there. The other thing we do is, and this is you know specific to us, but most of you have either done one or are aware of the weakness templates that we offer on the website. So if you have major holes in your game, whether it be gymnastics, handstand push up, muscle up, handstand wall, I mean, whatever, you name it, uh, barbell work, aerobic work, we have weakness templates that are two, three, four days a week that you could take out the accessory that you feel you don't need and complete a template over the course of a cycle and try to make noticeable change in something that really holds you back from competition. Make sense? And accessories are extras. So I, I won't say never, I rarely prescribe an accessory over something like a bitch work piece or over an interval or over anything unless the volume is the deterrent and I'm trying to give you less volume or you just need exposure to something that you're not getting exposure to, the athletes I coach. It's pretty rare. You get way more bang for your buck in something like a bitch work, a heavy lift, or a Metcon interval, which those are the gold standard we're getting to in a second. But the accessory is a nice extra if you're at that level that you can handle the extra volume. That's all I'm gonna say about that unless we have questions.